and dynamics or more, and whether that might be a better way to understand uh, the dynamics of galaxies and other astronomical systems. Um, so uh, in this talk, I'll be giving sort of a general overview of MOND covering the different uh, scales. Um, as you can see from the um, opening slide, the we, we have to explain the rotation curves of galaxies uh, as shown on the left and also observations like the bullet cluster, which are sometimes considered problematic for Vaughan. Um, and we have to explain both of these simultaneously, uh, regardless of um, whether we use Vaughan or something else. So just to give a brief uh, introduction to the, the problem, um, the this figure shows the rotation curve of a, a, a galaxy. Um, so the rotation speed as a function of distance from the center. And you can, based on the distribution of visible mass, you can predict what the rotation curve should look like. It should look like this dashed line. So basically, the most of the mass is within uh, about five kiloparsecond. Beyond that, the rotation curve starts to follow a Keplerian decline, just uh, the expected rotation curve, that is, just like the pla outer planets in the solar system orbit the sun slower. Um, but the actual rotation curve is up here. Uh, so this discrepancy um, might be due to dark matter. Uh, that's one of the uh, here, uh, one of the uh, hypotheses for what the discrepancy is caused by. Now, uh, in, if, if that was correct, then this would be the picture for what galaxies look like. They would have like a thin disk here and they would have a dark, dark matter halo here which is sort of shown in blue. Um, what you have to understand though, is that there is no direct evidence for this dark matter halo. Galaxies actually look like this. Uh, you obviously do not have direct evidence that there's lots of invisible matter here. Um, all you have is the visible disk of the galaxy rotating a bit too fast, especially in the outskirts. So that's important to bear in mind. Now, the discrepancy, uh, when we say that it's rotating too fast, this is with respect to the theoretical expectation, which is based on Newtonian gravity. Now, um, the, in, in Newtonian gravity, uh, the, um, this is the basic idea in the outskirts, where the, the galaxy can be considered basically as a point mass in the center, if you look at the outskirts. So you have the GM of R squared equating with the V squared over R the centripetal acceleration. Uh, because the powers of R are, are different, um, the V will start declining approximately the square root of R in, in the outskirts. That's what's supposed to happen um, in Newtonian gravity. Uh, now, we, we've seen that it's not correct observationally, but before we try and get on to the data, well, I wanted to explain um, why this might not be correct uh, in the outskirts of galaxies. Now, if we know that this equation is not always like correct from a theoretical perspective. For example, if the equation told you that the V or the circle of velocity was approximately the speed of light, then we know relativistic effects would become important. Um, and you couldn't really trust this equation anymore. Um, in this talk, however, it will be important to consider another like important area of physics which is neglected in this equation, and that is quantum mechanics. Um, obviously, Newtonian gravity was developed many centuries before quantum mechanics, so it neglects it, but without quantum mechanics, you wouldn't be able to see this talk, for example, the computers wouldn't work. So, uh, does quantum mechanics have a role here in, in galaxies? Um, so, basically, uh, the picture you want to have is that some region of space-time looks like this, and it's been curved by some mass. Okay. Now, classically, you approximate the space-time is looking like this, uh, and um, it's curved by the mass. Um, but obviously, the, these small-scale features are, are lost here. Now, that looks like a reasonable approximation. Essentially, it's, it's because of uh, the assuming that exact sort of positions and velocities like are meaningful. Um, so this, but this is a reasonable sort of approximation. Not exactly correct, but it should be reasonable. However, suppose you go much further away from the mass or you look at a much smaller mass. So in a, in a region with a much weaker gravitational field, it might look like this. 
it is slightly curved due to the mass, but there's also these small scale features which are neglected classically. And therefore, the extra sort of energy, if you like, in all these small features might be quite important uh, and uh, actually a lot more important than the energy due to it being slightly curved, where, which is the only thing present in, in this panel. So basically ignoring the fluctuations caused by quantum mechanics might not be a good approximation uh, at very low accelerations. Now, in, on the next slide, we'll try and quantify this. Um, in a sec. But basically the idea is that if you have some region of space time and it's kind of looks flat, but suppose you look at higher and higher and higher precision, eventually quantum effects will be important and you might be able to get the results correct to like three or four decimal places ignoring quantum mechanics, but maybe not to 10 decimal places. Just like if you want to work out the trajectory of a ball on the earth, it might work in Newtonian mechanics if you only want to know it to the nearest millimeter, but if you want to know it to the nearest nanometer, then you might need to take into account like quantum corrections. So uh, to quantify when quantum corrections might become important, one thing we can do is uh, use the uh, idea of a zero point energy which uh, arises in quantum mechanics because you know, gravitational fields for example can't have an exactly zero strength uh, for example it applies to other fields as well but um, essentially uh, this sort of uh, non-zero minimum energy um, it's reasonable to suppose that this is what is causing the universe to accelerate apart on large scales uh, what is known as the dark energy um, if we sort of equate that with the quantum zero point energy of the vacuum to be a reasonable guess for what is going on, then we can use the empirically determined dark energy density to estimate when quantum effects would become important. Uh, in other words, when the gravitational field has an energy density given here that is uh, comparable to the vacuum energy density or the, the dark energy density. So you can determine the dark energy density empirically. You can determine G empirically in the solar system. And uh, if you do that, you get to this particular value for the gravitational field strength. So basically what we're saying is, um, is that if the gravity is weaker than about this, quantum effects could be important. So I, on the next few slides, I'm just showing schematically what that might look like. If I plot the energy density as a function of the squared gravitational field strength, um, then uh, the vacuum energy density gives like a constant sort of contribution uh, at a certain level. The classically, the um, result is this line, this white line. Uh, in the real world, both are obviously going to have to be combined somehow. So maybe they can just be added, but maybe you, they can't just be added. And actually the result sort of tracks that for a bit longer and then comes down here and kind of tracks that. So may, maybe they add a bit differently. But in any case, we don't, can't really be sure of anything beyond the asymptotic limits. At a very low gravitational field strength, the rho vac is all you have. And at very high g squared, then you're on this white line. Uh, in this regime, it's very difficult to be sure what is going on. Um, so the answer to it is basically that we don't know. Um, but um, uh, what could happen then? is that classical theories which neglect quantum effects like break down in this regime. Um, so essentially, if you see that uh, at high accelerations, much above this, the uh, classical theory works, but at accelerations below this, it starts to fail. And the lower you go, the more significant the de departure from classical expectations. If you see something like that, uh, basically if you see an acceleration dependent discrepancy with the classical theory, it may well be a signature of quantum gravity effects. Admittedly, we don't understand them, but still that might be what is going on. Um, so now I want to show some of the observations bearing this in mind. So this is a, a rotation curve similar to what I was showing before, but another way to plot it is to is on the right panel where we show the observed centripetal acceleration Vc squared over R against the Newtonian gravity from the detectable mass or from the baryons um, neglecting, uh, uh, for example, the electrons and neutrinos. So if you try and uh, plot the same data, then you get basically on this relation. 
so the po the point is that um, th this discrepancy on the left panel shows up here as the data points being a long way above the line of equality in the right panel. Okay. Um, important to understand though is that in the right panel we have data from 153 galaxies, almost 2700 data points, and they all fall on this really tight relation. So you can see the residuals here. Uh, not only that, but we know that at high accelerations, the neutron gravity does work. For example, in the solar system or in like massive elliptical galaxies. Uh, the threshold I was talking about in the previous few slides from quantum mechanics is here. And indeed, there is a departure basically just when you get below that threshold. Um, so that's weird coincidence because the solar system is at much, much higher acceleration, way over to the right. Um, at least uh, 10 to the minus 6 meters per second square, but uh, generally much higher. On the Earth, it's 10 to the plus 1 meters per second square, basically. So many, many orders of magnitude to the right. And just when you get to about here, that's when you start to see a breakdown of the classical theory. Could be just a coincidence due to dark matter, but there's probably something uh, important here, um, uh, especially because it's also apparent in elliptical galaxies. So in elliptical galaxies, you can use the X-ray halos uh, to get like the pressures and temperature profile, and then you get a similar radial acceleration relation to the spirals, which is shown in blue in the background. And uh, you can also get the rotation curves of some elliptical galaxies when they have a subdominant component of gas, um, uh, but and it's rotating. So you can get a rotation curve in much the same way as for a spiral, basically. Uh, this doesn't work in like most ellipticals, but it works in a few cases. And uh, th there's three cases shown here. And the spiral galaxy radial acceleration relation is in the background, the uh, black uh, solid line, dashed line showing sort of a scatter, if you like. Uh, by the way, uh, the disk galaxy RAR, it, it, the scatter about it can be an entirely attributed to measurement uncertainties. It, there's no evidence for actual intrinsic scatter in the radial acceleration relation. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we have a tight RAR in spiral and elliptical galaxies, um, which brings us on to uh, the idea of uh, Milgromian dynamics or MON. Um, the first thing to understand is that a Newtonian gravity GR, uh, or, or GR even, were developed using solar system constraints. Um, uh, so, uh, it's possible uh, to have a breakdown in this theory when you get to much lower accelerations than we've seen in the solar system. Um, MOND was developed in 1983 to address the rotation curves, but without it assuming vast amounts of invisible or cold dark matter around galaxies. Um, essentially, uh, the Lagrangian would look like this. Uh, there's a kinetic part and a, a potential part. The kinetic part, by the way, is completely standard. So um, the particles follow a standard uh, law of inertia. The F equals ma will still work. Uh, the gravitational part is modified. Uh, if you extremize the action, uh, you get this equation relating the divergence of the gravitational field, to the divergence of some function times the Newtonian gravitational field. Okay, uh, and this is like a nonlinear function. Uh, so I'll explain the asymptotic limits in a sec. Um, but because of the non-linearity, um, there is what is called an external field effect. So having a constant external gravitational field across the system weakens its self-gravity. Um, so that's uh, what I want to say about the equations. Um, now, the asymptotic limits are, are much uh, simpler, of course, than, than this. Um, if you have a very weak amount of gravity, G and the Newtonian gravity is much less than A0, and the gravity is the square root of A0 times G. Okay. Uh, but at high accelerations, obviously, you need to recover the Newtonian limit. This is the correspondence principle I'd like to model, if you like. Um, one consequence of this, uh, of the low acceleration limit, uh, if you put GM over R squared for GN, then you will get this equation, that the out outer part of a rotation curve should go flat at the level given by the fourth root of uh, g a0 times the baryonic mass. So in other words, the data points should fall on this dotted line, uh, which is showing the relation between the rotation curve's flat line level and the baryonic mass. Um, 
what should happen in the standard theory is that the data should fall on this uh, line if galaxies have the same fraction of uh, baryons to dark matter as uh, the universe as a whole, which we think we know from things like the CMB. Um, what needs to happen then is galaxies need to go down sort of like this by means of blowing vast amounts of gas out through things like supernovae feedback. Uh, and because the dark matter is dominant, they, the VF doesn't change much, but the baryonic mass does. Um, now, this is theoretically possible, but you have uh, star-dominated galaxies in dark blue, gas-dominated galaxies in light blue. Um, what needs to happen is they need to have lost the same proportion of their baryons. In other words, the efficiency of feedback processes needs to be completely independent of how many supernovae actually went off, which is not really very realistic at all. Um, and not to mention there's a wide range of surface brightness uh, at fixed uh, baryonic mass. Uh, so wide range of radii, in other words, and wide range of uh, probably of merger histories and all sorts of other things, in addition to a wide range of gas fraction, which is what's shown with the color coding. So it's very unlikely that this will ever work in the standard uh, model where this is all just due to dark matter. And basically anything below this line would be possible in the standard lambda CDM picture. The idea of changing the slope from three to a slope of four with negligible intrinsic scattering doesn't make too much sense. Um, so uh, this is all non-relativistic stuff. Uh, briefly, I wanted to say uh, that there is a relativistic mon theory uh, where gravitational waves travel at the speed of light, uh, which is needed to explain certain observations. Uh, and uh, also in these theories, you have a GR-like light deflection. So in other words, the non-relativistic gravitational field felt by sort of slow moving particles like stars affects the trajectory of a photon in the same way as GR. OK, uh, so I'll come on to that in a sec uh, and some evidence regarding this. Um, basically, what I mean is that this equation remains valid in MON. So this, this works in GR, but it also works in MON. Uh, MON, by the way, obviously enhances the value of uh, G basically for the same baryonic distribution, but uh, the equation still works in both theories. Now, one way to look, uh, test this is through looking at, uh, so this week in MON, it's based on strong lensing data uh, that we set it up in that way, but you can uh, test it using galaxy galaxy weak lensing. So a galaxy distorts the shapes of background galaxies, the apparent shapes of background galaxies by deflecting the light. It kind of shears them in the tangential direction, um, kind of like an Einstein ring, but weaker. And uh, if you plot the radial acceleration relation for galaxy-galaxy um, weak lensing, so the observed acceleration against the GN, the, um, the Newtonian gravity from the baryons, then you get the relation which kind of looks like this. It actually goes down to much, much lower accelerations than um, the disk galaxies, which only go down to about here. So that's the blue points in the background, red points in the bin. Rotation curve results. Uh, so, but the weak lensing uh, allows us to go to much lower accelerations and you still follow the Mond expectation very, very closely uh, down to about five orders of magnitude below A0 in terms of the GN. And obviously about half as much in terms of actual G because the low acceleration slope of the RIR is predicted to be half in more. Um, now, uh, that's a weak lensing by galaxies. So the RIR works in a wide variety of systems and also for relativistic traces. Um, now, um, what about um, the dark matter picture? Does this make much sense in the, in the standard model? Well, um, in the standard picture, um, you can try and do a rotation curve fit. Uh, of a galaxy. Um, so here th there's an example where the data points are up there. The Newtonian rotation curves of the stars and gas are kind of here. So you need a lot of dark matter. This is the contribution from the dark halo. As a result, you can match the results pretty well. Um, it doesn't work in more. This galaxy cannot be fit in more. Okay. Uh, but before you conclude that Mond is wrong, I want to explain something very important here. Uh, the image used in the rotation curve fit was of the wrong galaxy. In other words, people were trying to fit the rotation curve of one galaxy using a photograph of a different one. Uh, and as a result, it didn't work in MOND, which is not too bad for MOND, actually. 
but it's uh, not a problem for the standard picture. Uh, the reason is if you're allowed to invent an arbitrarily large amount of invisible matter, you can fit almost anything. Um, so this rotation curve was fit perfectly using the wrong photograph in the Lambda CDM paradigm. Um, but it, it, it doesn't work in Mont. Um, OK, so one can fit the rotation curves for the real galaxies if you use the correct photo. Now, uh, one way to try and uh, look at uh, the problem uh, of whether the dark matter of the Mond is actually sort of better is to look at uh, the properties of the central bar in uh, each galaxy. So galaxies, uh, especially spiral galaxies, often have a bar in the middle, kind of a, a rod-shaped structure, which we think rotates at a essentially as a constant. It, it, it rotates at a certain pattern speed, omega p. It rotates almost as a solid body, and um, this rotation speed uh, would basically remain constant without a dark matter halo around it because there's nothing to sort of slow it down. But if there is a dominant dark halo, then the bar would slow down due to dynamical friction, uh, which is a certain kind of friction that essentially relies only on the gravity from dark matter particles which obviously you need if the dark matter particles are going to explain the flat rotation curve. Um, now, what is shown on the right panel is uh, the pattern speed omega p as a function of time in different simulations. So the uh, MOND, MOG and NLG are different gravity theories where galaxies lack dark halos and omega p remains constant in those models. Um, the orange and red models are Newtonian. The red model is a standard lambda CDM model where the bar slows down significantly, as you can see in the inset. The orange model, the dynamical friction from the halo on the bar has been artificially suppressed by means of treating the halo particles as fixed, basically. Um, it's not realistic, the orange model, but it does show that if you sort of turn off the dynamical friction, uh, you could uh, end up with a constant omega p also in um, uh, the lambda CDM model. So the the main difference here between the different theories is whether there is a dark halo that exerts dynamical friction. It's not to do with the gravity law as such. Um, so what I wanted to show next was um, some evidence regarding this. Uh, first of all, um, galaxies have a sort of a wide range of pattern speeds and sizes and uh, other things. So we quantify the pattern speed using the ratio of the co-rotation radius of the bar to its length. So the co-rotation radius is the radius where the angle of velocity of the bar matches the angle of velocity of stars on circle orbits in the galactic potential. So the same major axis. Um, so people have uh, analyzed this sort of problem over many decades. And essentially, if R is more than 1.4, you have a slow bar. This is 1 to 1.4 is fast bar uh, regime, and these are unphysical. Um, if, uh, so this I was showing you on the previous slide. Um, the results shown here are directly related to the distribution of the R parameter. Um, the reason is that the rotation curve rises almost linearly in the inner parts. Okay, and because of that, reducing omega p, the pattern speed by even a small amount, will significantly raise the co-rotation radius. It, um, the bar might also become a bit longer, but the co-rotation radius will go out, will go way out, and R will rise. So. Here, I'm showing the distribution of the R parameter, uh, its mean value and its intrinsic dispersion. Perhaps the main thing to look at is the mean value, which in the uh, lambda CDM model with the, with the live plumber halo is, is here, and it sort of rises with time. Uh, in the, uh, observationally, it's here. Uh, in MOND, it's here, okay, the black uh, ellipse. And uh, in the eagle, hydrodynamical cosmological simulation of lambda CDM. It starts here at, so it's here at redshift 0.5 uh, and redshift 0.27. By the time you get to redshift zero, it's all the way up here, which is completely incorrect observationally. The tension is eight sigma. Um, so, but it seems to work okay in MOND. Um, now th that's with the Eagle simulation. What about with other simulations? So we looked at the um, illustrious TNG simulation where you have the results shown uh, in um, green for TNG 100, blue for the very recent, very high resolution TNG 50, and uh, also the Eagle 100. 
uh, which we sort of reanalyzed. Um, the sample sizes are shown here, and, and the level of tension, which is about 14 sigma, 14 G100, 13 sigma, TNG 50. Um, waters, uh, so the, the tension is sort of limited, I think, by the sa sample size on the observations, which is uh, only 42. Um, 42 galaxies where the R parameter measurements were accurate enough to include in our statistical analysis. Um, now, uh, what you want to notice is the lambda CDM results are kind of uh, all consistent between different simulations. So for example, with the Eagle and TNG 100, uh, TNG 50, it's all consistent. So the lambda CDM results essentially numerically converge and uh, they converge on a value basically around here, which is uh, completely wrong. So the different levels of tension in the different simulations are essentially ratio to the sample size. There's a bit less tension in the small sample and a bit more here. But um, you won't get much more tension because um, then the error bar will be dominated by the error bar on the observation. Um, so that's uh, the R parameter, the, the pattern speeds of bars. Uh, there's a clear evidence against the dynamical friction from dominant dark matter halos. Now, um, so that's the uh, galaxies. Now I wanted to talk about what happens in cosmologies. So you're probably thinking that, well, maybe one doesn't really work on larger scales. Um, but I think it, it does, and uh, part of my talk is on that. Um, so uh, in the cosmological setting, the way uh, MON probably works is called the neutrino hot dark matter paradigm, uh, new HDM, proposed by Gary Angus uh, in 2009. The cosmic pie chart, if you like, looks like this in new HDM. It's actually basically the same as the standard uh, model, except that instead of cold dark matter, you have hot dark matter. Uh, so we do still need additional dark matter in more, think, but it would not be cold, it would be hot. In particular, the most logical scenario is that you have 11 electron volt uh, sterile neutrinos, which have the same overall mass energy density as the cold dark matter in lambda CDM. Now, uh, the result would will be that you get a standard um, expansion rate history uh, leading to standard um, primordial nucleosynthesis. So like the abundance of deuterium and uh, helium and very early time lithium. Um, MOND enters the problem not at the background level, but at the perturbation level. You need to apply MOND to the density perturbations. So field equations I was showing earlier should be applied only to, to the uh, excess or, uh, of the density above the cosmic mean, or you know, it could also be a negative value like under density. Uh, and you need to include the external field from surrounding structures if you're simulating only a small part of the universe. But in principle, if you have a large enough volume simulation, you don't need to include external field because whatever was the source of the external field will already be in your simulation. Uh, if you want to read more about how to handle the external field effect sort of analytically, you can see some fairly simple uh, derivations here uh, for the external field dominated limit. Um, OK, so that's the uh, cosmological picture uh, you probably need in order to make MOND actually viable. Now, what does it do to the cosmic background radiation? Well, because you have a standard expansion history of the same angular diameter distance to the CMB, uh, MOND is subdominant then because the gravitational fields were much higher than A0. Um, also, free streaming effects are negligible for neutrinos with a mass greater than 10 electron volts by C squared, according to the Planck collaboration, because uh, you, you see in this section of, that um, they um, required the uh, sterile neutrinos to be less massive than 10 EV, because anything more, the particles are so massive that their effect on the CMB spectra is identical to CDM. So um, obviously, if you have 11 EV by C squared sterile neutrinos, then you satisfy this constraint. So that is why um, Angus and Dia Ferio in 2011 were able to obtain a really good fit to the CMB power spectrum. Uh, so red is lambda CDM and blue is a new HDM. So neglecting MON, but uh, with the cold dark matter replaced by sterile neutrinos. They didn't change the total amount of dark matter or the amount of baryons they slightly change the tilt of the spectral index and very slight change in the Hubble constant. But uh, with that, they were able to obtain like basically a really essentially perfect fit to the CMP. 
Now you could change the parameters slightly, I guess, to optimize the fit, but um, there's no problem fitting the CMB in MON uh, at all. MON doesn't really affect it. Uh, it affects the universe when the redshift is less than about 50, because the universe expands another 20 times compared to the epoch of predictive combination, then uh, MON becomes important. Um, but not when the redshift uh, is when the redshift is 1100. OK, so what about the sterile neutrinos I was talking about? Um, these have also, um, there have been some hints for them on the ground uh, by Mini Boon, for example. Um, so one often gets graphs like this for the sterile neutrino mass and the likelihood of the, of the sterile neutrino having such a mass. So orange is like the result of terrestrial experiments, which prefer some masses. Um, one thing that is slightly wrong here is the results are cut off at 10 EV by C squared because people generally assume that uh, the cosmological observations imply the neutrinos should not be more massive than 2 EV by C squared. However, this blue curve, which is labeled cosmology, is assuming the lambda CDM paradigm. Um, so that's definitely a very model dependent thing. Uh, not to mention uh, the results themselves were published in the Journal of Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics, which is itself a major conflict of interest if uh, the dynamical discrepancies are in fact not due to a particle galaxy scales at least. Um, so uh, there's definitely some room for a particle physicist to look at the uh, 11 EV by C squared and see if that, that works uh, with things like catering, for example. OK, so uh, with these, assuming these three neutrinos exist, we can actually fit uh, the bullet cluster as uh, shown by Angus and collaborators in 2007. So in the bullet cluster, there's an offset between the X-ray and weak lensing peaks. Uh, which was argued to be strong evidence uh, for the existence of collisionless uh, matter. Um, now, the first thing to realize is because the gravity is above A0, MOND effects are not particularly strong. Uh, so in, in MOND also, um, collisionless matter is required. That's the bottom line. But does this need to be called dark matter? And the answer is no. As long as you have sterile neutrinos with a mass more than two electron volts by C squared, that will be enough. Um, there is no evidence that the extra collisionless matter is necessarily the same as the dark matter that would be needed to explain the flat rotation curves of galaxies. It could be a different uh, type of thing. Um, so sterile neutrinos with mass of above 2 EV by C squared would work. Uh, but in some other galaxy clusters, you need a slightly higher mass. So if you want to fit um, other galaxy clusters, you uh, you, you need a bit more, but with 11 EV by C squared, uh, it's possible to fit basically all the realized galaxy clusters analyzed by Angus et al. 2010. And the Buller cluster, obviously even with 2 EV by C squared, the Buller cluster would work. So with 11, it will definitely work. Um, and uh, the with the CMB, you need a mass more than 10. Um, with the galaxy rotation curves, uh, to, for them to be unaffected by the sterile neutrinos, you need a mass less than 300. In case you're wondering, like, how do we know what the mass of the sterile neutrino is? The reason is that there is a limit to the phase space density of the sterile neutrinos, uh, basically because of the Pauli exclusion principle. Um, and it's called the Tremaine gun limit. Uh, and um, the larger the neutrino mass, because you still have the same number density of particles at the Tremaine gun limit, you can have a larger actual density. Okay, so if you know how much actual density you need to fit the Buller cluster, uh, then and you know the maximum particle number density, then you know the, the minimum particle mass, uh, which is uh, about this. But it's a bit higher in other galaxy clusters. So uh, yeah, because of the trimming gun limit, we, uh, we have to worry about satisfying that. That's uh, the main thing. But it is possible to satisfy that and the CMB without causing uh, unobserved free streaming effects um, and without affecting galaxy rotation curves. So it is possible to build a consistent framework. Now, uh, one aspect of the Buller cluster that was considered a bit problematic is its high collision velocity. Uh, but the, a more extreme case is El Gordo, which is um, a pair of galaxy clusters which are um, which are interacting with each other and they've sort of uh, collided with each other at very, very high speed at redshift 0.87 and with a very, very high mass. Um, so what we did in, in this paper is we used 
uh, previous hydrodynamical simulations in lambda CDM, um, but these are not not cosmological simulations. It's just covering the interaction uh, to pin down the pre-merger configuration of El Gordo, and then we use cosmological simulations to see if uh, such a pre-merger configuration can ever arise out of the initial density fluctuation in the CMB. Um, so we use the Jubilee simulation here. And we using the Jubilee simulation, we worked out the mass redshift distribution of uh, interacting galaxy clusters along our past light cone, where the dimensionless parameters are similar to El Gordo, but um, obviously they could be at a different mass or at a different redshift. Um, so that's shown in this graph. So the M tilde is basically the logarithm of the mass. El Gordo sits up here. It's also the pre-merger configuration is a bit early than when we observe El Gordo, but basically it's when the redshift was one or the scale factor was half. Now, um, the distribution, expected distribution of uh, galaxy cluster uh, collisions like El Gordo is shown here. So this is a one signal uh, limit, three signal limit, and a five signal limit. Uh, El Gordo is outside that. Um, El Gordo is on the 6.16 sigma contour, the, the solid red contour. Okay, and even with the 20% uncertainty in the mass, it doesn't change the results very much. Um, basically, uh, El Gordo falsifies lambda CDM at 6.16 sigma. In other words, the likelihood of lambda CDM explaining El Gordo is, is 7.51 times 10 to the minus 10. Um, so again, lambda CDM is, is ruled out by uh, galaxy clusters forming too fast. There's also evidence for galaxies forming too fast uh, as well, which I won't go into in this talk, but uh, re recently that has become clear also. So uh, that's the El Gordo. Uh, another issue is um, the keenan baga Kawi or KBC void, which is a large local under density going out to 300 megaparsec, while the density is about half the cosmic mean, and this has been observed over 90% of the sky. The fractional under density is about 46%. Now that's shown in this figure, the density divided by the cosmic mean as a function of the distance. Um, the data points are all sort of around one here, which is, uh, that's the figure's kind of been calibrated that way. This is the cosmic mean. The data points are on the cosmic mean. Unless you, well, until you look at very low distances, so within 300-ish megaparsec, then you get this light blue point, which is based on the two micron all sky survey, uh, magnitudes uh, brighter than 14.36. And uh, this covers 90% of the sky between 40 and 300 megaparsec. This is the result that they got, uh, you could read off here. Um, so uh, is that uh, going to, it, it, do voids like that exist in a Lambda CDM uh, cosmological simulation? So we wanted to answer that question. And what we did is we looked at spheres with um, sort of thick shells with radii of like 40 to 300 megaparsec. And we plotted like the histogram of the density fluctuations within that region. So the density divided by the cosmic mean uh, like um, one uh, minus that. So you get this blue histogram. In other words, density fluctuations are possible to some extent in Lambda CDM. But on average, you would expect like a Gaussian dispersion of about 4.8%. Uh, and therefore, it's completely impossible to explain the observed 46% under density. Okay, so that has an uncertainty of 6% as well. But still, um, this is the observed uh, sort of data point and it's uncertainty. And this is what happens in the simulation. So the theory also allows causing variance. But despite that, uh, there is a 6.04 sigma tension. In other words, the KVC void completely falsifies lambda CDM. Um, one a slight uh, thing to notice here is uh, we have made a slight allowance for redshift space distortion. In other words, if you have a large local void, or if you have like an under density, then uh, there will be outflows um, to make, make that under density, and that will lead to a higher local Hubble constant which will uh, distort the relation between uh, distances and redshifts that were, was assumed by the observers. Um, and that has the effect of broadening this Gaussian from 3.2% to 4.8%. But we already included that. Uh, it, it has only a small impact on the results. Um, one thing it does do, though, is that um, large under density will lead to a higher local Hubble constant, 
Uh, and this is an important thing which I wanted to show uh, next using that reference. So what's shown here is the fractional under density against the fraction uh, the, the ratio between the local Hubble constant and the global one. So the, uh, as you as I was saying, um, for an, to have an under density, the local Hubble constant must be slightly more than the global one. Uh, and uh, at one sigma, it could be up here. So you have a, some under density and some enhancement to the Hubble constant. And five sigma, you can be up here, but the observations are up here. And OK, they have uncertainties as well, but this is the five sigma limit. So it's impossible to get within the five sigma observation allowed region with cosmic variance at the five sigma limit uh, in lambda CD. Um, so in other words, if you combine the KBC void and Hubble tension, you get a 7.09 sigma falsification. One thing to realize, though, is that this point is actually kind of more or less why you would get if you continue this line further. So if you had a way to enhance cosmic variance beyond lambda CDM expectations, you might be able to match the data. Um, another thing to understand is because we have both an under density and an anomalously high local Hubble constant, the likelihood of all this being some sort of uh, fluke measurement error at seven sigma like, discrepant from the actual value is extremely unlikely. Um, so uh, what we did is we tried to fit the KVC void in MOND uh, using um, a semi-analytic model. Okay, uh, with an you initial, have about five minutes. Yeah, sure. Uh, with an initial uh, under density profile, we, we tried other types of profile like an exponential stuff. Results stay similar. Um, and uh, there's external gravity from beyond the void, which weakens the self gravity and cause it to move as a whole with respect to the surface of last scattering. Um, now, uh, the under density sort of grows with time. So, it, but in the standard model, it's a red curve, so it grows only a little bit. Uh, in MOND, um, the under density grows very quickly uh, and uh, you end up with, um, well, on this graph, you see the density profile of the void. The under density profile looks like that after 13.8 giga year. So you're able to match the observations within their uncertainty and in the inner part of the void and also the outer part where the densities reach the causing mean. Our model does as well, basically. Um, so uh, another thing is uh, the local Hubble diagram. So the local expansion rate has increased. Uh, as I was saying, the apparent expansion rate appears to accelerate at late times, uh, where this Q0 bar parameter is the, related to the double derivative derivative of the apparent scale factor. Um, this is basically because the expansion rate is higher than the global average, but only like very close to us. So this is extra upturn in the Hubble, in the expansion rate, the apparent expansion rate. And this Q0 bar was um, measured at 1.08 plus minus 0.29, but the standard value is 0.55. Um, and this uh, higher, high measured value is suggestive of a local void. Um, so if you plot the Q0 bar, the acceleration parameter against the Hubble constant, you have the Planck value and you have the observed value along with the error ellipses. Um, the, uh, our models are basically here. That's the, where the best model is. And uh, the blue and uh, squares and, and, and the triangle is sort of hidden behind it. They're actually at the same point. So for the maxwell boltzmann gaussian exponential profile, you get much the same results. You can match the observations within one sigma. Yeah, so we can solve the Hubble tension and the KVC void simultaneously. Um, now, um, if you come uh, look at various other sort of observations, uh, like uh, you, we've managed to get uh, an overall 2.53 sigma tension with this uh, combination of the KVC void density profile, the Hubble constant, and also the local group peculiar velocity with respect to the CMB, which is 630 kilometers a second. That's slightly problematic for a model, but only at 2.34 sigma. So. We can explain the observations, uh, unlike in lambda CDM, where the tension is obviously much more than five sigma. Um, and there have been some recent papers where the tension has sort of worsened, like the this paper sort of shows up the low Planck value for H0, and this one shows up the high um, supernova value for H0, but using a completely different technique based on mega So There have been many other papers. Uh, I would not want to talk about the Hubble tension too much. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll just get on to my conclusions then which is uh, that we can construct a viable cosmological model in MON called the neutrino hot dark matter or new HDM model. Um, the 
we have a standard expansion rate history and therefore big band nucleosynthesis. We can explain the CMB because the gravitational fields are much higher than A0. Then. So MON doesn't do anything, but the sterile neutrinos do. We have non-standard structure growth at redshifts below 50. Uh, we can explain the dynamics of like the Burr cluster and other virilized galaxy clusters. And also galaxy rotation curves, this is just standard form, right? the neutrinos don't really interfere with that. Um, so in case you're wondering, there is a slightly affected by neutrinos if the mass is sort of 2, 300, but it could still be accommodated. Um, so um, the new HDM model uh, often predicted uh, failures of lambda C on galaxy scales, especially the planes of satellite galaxies, which I don't want to talk about uh, this time. Um, but these are seriously problematic for lambda CDM because there's one around the Milky Way, M31, and also Centaurus A. Um, there's other small scale failures, such as the high fraction of thin disk galaxies, uh, also shown by Peebles recently. Um, and there's uh, the um, high velocity of NGC 3109, which could be due to a past Milky Way Andromeda flyby, uh, which would also nicely explain the satellite blades. Um, so uh, th these are the papers on the past bars which I was talking about earlier. So uh, regarding large scale structure, the KBC void and El Gordo galaxy cluster collision falsify lambda CDM at high significance. Both under densities and over densities are much more pronounced than in lambda CDM, uh, but they would be natural in new HD. Um, okay, so if you want to see the latest results, uh, there's the blog by Stacy McGaw in, in uh, Cleveland and this one by the group in Bonn, um, where I was working before. Uh, so not just one team, one person, all around the world, we're working on this sort of thing. Um, so uh, I, that's um, it for my talk. Uh, thank you for listening. Great. Well, thank you very much for an interesting talk. And, and we have some time for some questions. Um, so either type them into the chat or 